Hello, and welcome to the Middle East Forum speaker webinar series and podcast. I'm Stacey Roman, and I will be moderating this discussion today. We are pleased to have Mordechai Kedar, a lecturer at Bar Ilan University and vice president of Newsreel, a news site focused on Israel, join us to discuss what will Israel's next war look like. Uh, Dr. Kidar will speak for 15 minutes and open it up for questions. Should you wish to ask a question, please use the Q&A button located at the bottom of your screen to type your question. And with that, I'll turn the discussion over to Dr. Mordechai Kidar. Thank you so much. And uh, I thank also Daniel Pipes uh, for arranging this form. And uh, from here, I, I send my sincere condolences to Daniel. Uh, for the passing of his uh, mother. And I thank everyone who came to this uh, webinar, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, it is a, not a small challenge to wrap such a subject of uh, how will Israel's next war look like uh, in 15 minutes, but I'll do my best. Um, first of all, the background of this discussion is what is happening in the state of Israel for the last, uh, I would say, eight months, uh, almost seven months, uh, the demonstrations and the riots here in Israel and blocking of roads and, um, and the lists of uh, combatants and uh, pilots and uh, all kinds of fighters who announced that they will not volunteer to the army uh, unless the government stops with the correction of the balance between the Knesset and the uh, judicial system. Uh, this um, phenomenon of groups of soldiers who announce that they are not going to volunteer to the army actually gave a big, big blow to the Israeli image of an invincible country. Uh, because here in the Middle East, uh, people uh, view uh, each other and especially Israel, through the lens of power. Uh, this is not through the lens of human rights or um, uh, all kinds of innovations in high tech. First of all, and the most important uh, component of your image is your power. If you are powerful, people will respect you. If you are weak, you are doomed. And this is unfortunately the Middle East. Um, and since this uh, phenomenon of uh, Israelis, soldiers, pilots, and so forth, who announced that they are not willing to, to uh, volunteer to the army unless the government uh, do this and that, uh, uh, this actually uh, uh, reduces the image of the state of Israel vis-a-vis -vis its uh, uh, enemies. And we, are, we still have some here in the Middle East, if to mention some, uh, Iran, Hezbollah uh, in Lebanon, and uh, Hamas, and there are more. Therefore, since Israel's image is becomes weak, now many of them st start thinking that, hey, this is the time maybe to start preparations to the next war. And this is actually what we see in Lebanon. We see it also in other places. We see it recently in Syria when Iranian troops start all kinds of things in Syria, and we do monitor what happens there. And we do see that the, I would say, the glands of the jihad in the mindset of our enemies become more, become bigger and bigger. And this actually uh, uh, might lead them to start a war thinking that Israel is stripped of its fourth force and power, and Israel now is an easy prey uh, to uh, uh, deal with. So uh, this is why we here in Israel already started to talk about the next war in open media. I, I did it, uh, I think it was uh, four months ago when I published an article uh, about the next war. And uh, I think this is the cause for this uh, webinar, which we are now. Um, first of all, uh, we have to remember that the next war is driven from the mindset of our uh, enemies. And in their mindset, the best war against Israel should be 
from a large number or largest number of fronts. If they can have everyone attack, attack Israel from all the directions, this will be the best Israel cannot uh, survive. And actually, this is what history shows us. In 1948, the uh, independence war was from Egypt, Jordan, Syria, uh, Iraq also sent troops and some other countries as well. Uh, the 1956 a uh, war was, was only with Egypt, but Israel initiated it. And this is, uh, actually shows that Israel doesn't want wars with other fronts. The 1967 was with three, three fronts, um, Egypt, Jordan, Syria. The 1969-70, the attrition war, which we had both with Syria and with Egypt, definitely uh, two fronts at one time. And the 1973, the Yom Kippur War, uh, was against two countries, means Egypt and Syria. So our enemies always try to uh, uh, make us fight in more than one front in order to uh, uh, be uh, more powerful vis-a-vis -vis, uh, Israel and to cause problems to Israel because Israel now has to divide its forces between two, fr two front two uh, and maybe more fronts. This is why, since this is the mindset here in the Middle East, it's most probably that the next war will also, at least they will try to have it multi-frontal uh, uh, war. And actually Iran, which actually gathers power in the Middle East, thanks to some administrations in the United States of America, uh, and other uh, countries as well, like China and, and Russia, uh, they are uh, putting a lot of effort into the connection between Lebanon and Hezbollah, Syria, Iraq, Yemen, and Gaza. This is their dream, to unite all these fronts in order to open a war in, at, at one moment uh, against Israel, from all these five uh, fronts. So this is actually the worst scenario which we can envision today. And we have to be prepared uh, to this scenario because this is what the Iranians try to do. If they succeed or not, time will say. But they actually try to do this. And this is what, what explains the frequent visits of the head of the uh, IRGC and the Quds Force uh, like Suleimani and Ka'ani, uh, uh, very frequently they come to Lebanon, to Syria, of course, to Iraq, Yemen also, uh, not Gaza yet, but it might come. So this is uh, what we assume and this is what we, we're going to see and this is what we have to be prepared for. The, and another thing which uh, will characterize the next war uh, will be the large usage of missiles means that uh, less tanks, uh, Hezbollah doesn't have tanks. They don't have cannons. Uh, they don't have submarines. They don't have ships. They have a hell of a lot of missiles. Uh, some sources, open sources, say that they have some 150,000 missiles of all shapes, sizes, lengths, and uh, uh, weights. And they can attack Israeli uh, uh, gas facilities in the Mediterranean Sea. They can uh, act uh, they, against uh, the, uh, uh, the Israeli ships in the sea, of, of course, uh, military ships as well. They can act against um, infrastructure. They can act against uh, um, um, air bases of the Air Force here in Israel. And of course, against cities. And this actually leads us to the third characteristic of the next war, not only missiles, but the fact that, that they will attack, no doubt, cities, uh, civil infrastructure, not necessarily army. They, of course, they will try to, to target the army in order to, uh, uh, and, uh, to disable Israel, uh, you know, to revenge or to, to fight against them. But uh, they will definitely target uh, power stations, um, uh, communication centers, transportation centers, um, uh, railways, um, ha um, uh, uh, bridges, harbors, 
uh, and definitely, and, and these are all civil uh, uh, targets. Not only this, they will try to cause as many as they can casualties in the civil front uh, in order to spread demoralization uh, within the people. Because people in the street are much more exposed than uh, soldiers in, in tanks. They're, therefore, and, and they already did it. Now, why do they do this? Because they are not states. Hezbollah in the north and the militias in Syria or those in Iraq who will launch uh, drones and missiles uh, or from Yemen who can also uh, uh, send and launch missiles and, and drones against Israel. And of course, Hamas, they don't consider themselves to be states. Iran is a state, but the militias in everywhere are not states. And since they are not states, they are not bound by the laws of war which bind states. This is why, from their point of view, in, in, a, a civilian population in Israel are no less attractive uh, target than soldiers uh, of the army. And we have to, to uh, take it in account because in every clash with them, the casualties within civil society will be not only big, they will be deliberate. Delib they, they, they will deliberately target uh, civil targets. And this is something which usually states are forced to refrain from because, you know, the Geneva Convention and all these uh, uh, laws of war uh, which bind states, but they, are, they don't feel uh, that they are bound by anything because they are militias. And they call it uh, mukawama in Arabic means re uh, revolution or resistance. Since they are a resistance against whom I, I don't know, but uh, they are resistance, they allow themselves to attack their enemy, means Israel, uh, uh, without any restriction, which states have to act according to international law. Ladies and gentlemen, this is the worst scenario which we all have to uh, get used to in order not to be shocked psychologically when it starts and unfortunately, God forbid, it might even uh, be uh, this way. And, uh, you know, things might happen only because, because they can. Since they can do all all these things, they can launch missiles, they can launch uh, drones, and they actually today uh, uh, have a, a battlefield in Ukraine to make sure that the drones are good drones. Now, uh, they launch them, not they, maybe the Russians, are launching them against the Ukrainians. So they can get uh, feedback from Ukraine in order to make their, these drones and missiles as well uh, much better, much more lethal, after the, they try them on, on Ukraine. And here, I, I, I would like to give one comment about Ukraine. What happens in the Ukraine when all these things happen, the civil society is being attacked tremendously, uh, the usage of missiles, and the, uh, uh, the, the fact that Russia attacks in many places in Ukraine, actually reminds us the scenario which... Uh, which I'm, I'm talking here, of course, it's one state, Russia, but it, it has common denominators with, with, uh, with what we have here, what we might have here. And the world uh, continues to roll over. And uh, the, the heaven do not fall on, the, on, on earth. And this actually what implicitly legitimizes what happens in Ukraine, that the world uh, continues its daily life, although a state is uh, uh, devastated by Russia. This actually gives the Iranians the idea that even if they attack Israel in such a vicious way, which I uh, described, the world will not take it so seriously, just like the world doesn't take so seriously what happens in Ukraine. And it encourages them. And makes the, as we say, the jihad glands more and more, uh, more, more, more bigger. And this is in, in very short, uh, only in, 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 in few points, what I think 
uh, will be the image of the next war between Israel and its enemies. All right, thank you so much for that. The first question we have is from Michael Kerbel asking, in your opinion, what is more likely, a civil war from within Israel a war, or a war with our neighbors or no war at all? And what might the time frame of each be? Well, civil war in Israel between whom? Between, between the Israel and the Arab population who are 20% of our citizens? Uh, we already see, we have already seen uh, two and more ye years ago in May 2021, we saw the riots of Arabs in Israel. Uh, some Jews were killed. And this definitely was um, something which uh, might repeat itself um, if, uh, if, they, if they do it again. So definitely we have to get uh, uh, you know, ready to the inner front between Jews and Arabs as we already seen in May 2021. Between Jews and Jews, what you see today, this will always be demonstrations, um, announcements in the, in, the, in the newspapers. It will, it can be uh, some kinds of uh, uh, boycotting of uh, some companies who do this or that. The, but this is the, what happens here. Israel is democracy and uh, Israel doesn't believe in civil war within the Jews here in Israel. Thank you so much. Uh, so Leonard Sands says, uh, the likelihood of a future war seems certain. Our enemies will be better armed. What preparations and tactics might we see on the Israeli side in anticipation of the next attack? Well, you don't expect me to expose what Israel uh, is preparing vis-a-vis -vis the Iranians, especially not in public. Uh, look, but frankly, I... I left the IDF, the intelligence corps, in 1995, means 28 and more years ago. And I detached myself from any clandestine sources of information. So I really don't know. Uh, after all, I want to speak freely in uh, occasions like this one. Uh, so and I don't want to sift uh, what I say all the time between you know, uh, information which I know from open sources and information which I know from uh, uh, not open sources. So therefore, this is why I detach myself from any uh, clandestine source. So I, I, I really don't uh, know what Israel really prepares against the Iranians and their tentacles in, uh, in uh, Lebanon, in Syria, in Iraq, Yemen, and Gaza. And Gaza. Understood. Uh, so Andrew Rose Marine asks, uh, should Israel, to minimize her multi-front exposure, launch a full-scale attack to destroy enemies' weaponry in anticipatory self-defense? Well, Israel doesn't look for wars. Uh, if there is a way, you know, to push a war uh, uh, or to postpone a war, usually Israel will do it only if... Uh, war in the, in the future will be much more dangerous, like if Iran succeeds to acquire nuclear weapons, maybe Israel will do something in order to prevent it, even in the cost of a war, because to have a war against nuclear state like Iran is something which might be very dangerous. So, uh, but here you, you have all kinds of international considerations, uh, the, the American administration, what they want or they do not want vis-a-vis -vis Iran, uh, apparently, the American current administration has already gave up uh, the idea to disarm Iran from nuclear, nuclear weapons. So, uh, okay, the United States might have different uh, I would say accounts uh, compared to Israel. Israel will have to decide what Israel is doing according to Israel's interests and not according to not so much as it is according to American uh, interests. Thank you. And on that note, do you think that the Americans would actually join Israel should a multi-front war break out? I have no idea. Uh, look, I'm more than sure that there are all kinds of talks between, between the Israeli army and the, and the American army. There are plans, as, as you know, the, and this is open information. Once a year, there is a big drill 
uh, which uh, joins the IDF, the American army, or Air Force sometimes, uh, Navy sometimes, the Egyptian one, and others uh, occasionally. So uh, definitely, the, and, and they are not uh, uh, you know, arranging these gears only for the demonstration of power. They actually uh, are uh, training on factual scenarios together. So uh, what are the plans of the American army, whether or not to take part in any war between Israel and its enemies? I have no idea, and uh, good so. Thank you. Larry Greenberg asked, will Israel hold the states from which the attacks occur responsible and uh, make them to suffer the consequences? Is Israel p- prepared to deliver an initial, wow, sorry, I can't talk today, an initial massive devastating response, a uh, coordinated attack to beat it down? Look, uh, there is um, here an idea in Israel that if we only uh, deal with the Iranians, all the others will not dare to do anything against us. Why? Because they are all supported by Iran, all equipped by Iran, all armed by Iran mainly. And without Iran, they have actually no backbone which will unite them all. Uh, therefore, Israel doesn't have to deal so much with Hezbollah or the militias in, in Syria, Iraq, Yemen, or even Hamas. Israel should concentrate on how to bring Iran to its knees, how to devastate uh, the military power of Iran. And uh, this will actually, uh, you know, just to hit the head of the octopus rather than fighting with its tentacles. Uh, This is an idea, this has its logic. Uh, Yet, don't forget that uh, Iran is not not so close to us. We, We need to pass Jordan, we have to pass Iraq, and it's not easy. And, you know, war in far, uh, on far targets is always not easy, especially for Israel, which is a small country. Uh, and not only this, the states between Israel and Iran are not so friendly. Uh, Jordan has peace with us, but it doesn't mean that they will allow us to go to the east uh, freely. Iraq um, is a mayhem. So I don't know who, 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 who takes care of Iraq. Uh, and whom you can uh, coordinate such a thing if you want to pass above Iraq on your way to to Iran. So uh, it's not easy to attack Iran, yet there are ways, and I'm more than sure that if the army, Israeli army, gets an order, hey guys, you have a week to to attack Iran here, 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 and here, uh, the army will do it, and will do it uh, even well. Uh, What will be the consequences? Good question. Thank you. Lucille Kaplan asked, uh, she says she's a great supporter of your work, as you know, uh, but would you support a movement based in Israel that would advocate for and craft a national constitution uh, in, uh, as uh, it causes this division against Israelis today that is contributing significantly to dissent against among military personnel and thereby increasing risks of unprovoked attacks. Definitely, there is deep connection between the balagan, as we say, uh, the chaos in the political and the judicial, uh, or the the tension between the authorities in Israel, between the legislative and the and the judicial, because with the years since 1993, more or less, the judicial system actually occupied more and more areas of government. And today, the situation in Israel is the judicial system is above the legislative and above the executive. And this is not a democracy. This is a juristocracy uh, because these people in the court system are not elected. They are professionals and they control the country. And and this is an awkward, a, a situation which occurs only in Israel in the whole democratic uh, world. Uh, and uh, the Knesset uh, decided that enough is enough because it, Knesset is elected, Knesset is uh, sovereign. But the hands of uh, the Knesset are cuffed by the decisions of the Supreme Court and, and other courts. So uh, th- today we are now in a, I would say, constitutional 
uh, debate or constitutional crisis, uh, which will have no other way but to solve it in a way or another. Otherwise, there is no state because if people continue to fight each other and uh, to burn the bonds, uh, this is not uh, the way how to run a state. Thank you. Anita Brahm asked, uh, what might we expect in uh, diaspora regarding attacks, especially if war, as you describe, breaks out? What should we prepare for and what timeline? Uh, I guess we're asking the timeline question again, sorry. Of this war, might we expect? No, we all do assume that if it's a real war uh, at the door or already entered the door, uh, all the differences will be pushed aside, and all the army, all the pilots, and all everyone who today signs those petitions will throw away everything, and they will grab the rifle, and the helmet, and the anti-bullet suit, and we'll all run to their units and Israel will be victorious again and if needed again and again and again because as you as you know the first war which Israel lose it will also be its last war so we can we don't have this luxury to lose wars otherwise we are doomed so uh, they they can you know time and again and again and again but they have a uh, uh, un uh, unfinished uh, resources, especially manpower. Uh, Israel is a small country, and Israel, and we fight with our back to the sea. Uh, so we have no option to lose a war. And everybody knows it, even those who are against the government. Uh, therefore, uh, since I do believe that they do care about the country, otherwise they wouldn't demonstrate in the streets, in order to keep the country the way they, the, the way they like. I, I don't, don't agree with them. But uh, everybody here is loyal to the state and wants the state to sustain and uh, to continue living and what, so forth. And uh, this is why when a real danger uh, will threaten the state of Israel, uh, Israel will return to its unity, uh, especially against our enemies. And our, our iron fist will break the nose of whoever tries to get rid of us. Thank you. An anonymous attendee asked, will establishing relation with Saudi Arabia disrupt the ambition of Iran and change the equation at all? Uh, I, I don't think so. Uh, what happened uh, do, during the last uh, couple of months that uh, Saudi Arabia actually crawled to, uh, uh, to Iran is based on the fact that, that the United States actually betrayed the Saudis. This is how they feel uh, on one side. Israel is a weak country because of its image, because of these demonstrations and these uh, petitions. So Saudi Arabia, which is a very weak country, after all, militarily, it's very weak. It, of course, it has its religious uh, weight. They have their money. They have uh, everything. But uh, from, the, from the military point of view, uh, Saudi Arabia is a very weak country. Uh, as, as, and the proof is that they could not get rid of the Houthis a militia of barefoot people in Yemen uh, who are fighting Saudi Arabia, which is armed with a state-of-the-art American uh, uh, weaponry. So, and they and they failed, totally failed in their war against the Houthis. So, uh, Saudi Arabia is a weak country. Uh, so, getting, you know, in, in, in relations with Saudi Arabia at this time, um, I'm not so sure that Israel it's plays you know it's it's the best best uh, option for Israel. What will we get from Saudi Arabia? What investments? Uh, tourists they will not come here in big numbers uh, because Israel is a liberal country, and if they come, they will go to the beach, and the and the government in Saudi Arabia will not encourage it. Um, the, the peace with Saudi Arabia is definitely a dream of any Israel, left, right, center. Uh, every Israeli wants to see peace with the, with the Saudis or mutual recognition. Um, so uh, definitely it will contribute to the stature of Israel. Yet uh, we assume, means we, the, the Israeli men in the street, assumes that the understandings between Israel and Saudi Arabia is that Saudi Arabia will demand something 
in the Palestinian arena uh, in order to appease the Palestinians and other Arabs in the, in the Arab world uh, who do care for the Palestinians still. So uh, I, I'm not sure that uh, Israel will be willing to pay this payment uh, to the uh, Saudi uh, regime. Uh, Israel might uh, very possibly say, hey guys, you want peace with us? Come sit with us, regardless of any other problem. If you want peace with us, have peace with us. Not uh, with the uh, Palestinians, not with others. This might be the Israeli uh, answer to any attempt to combine the peace with Saudi Arabia with all kinds of things in the Palestinian uh, arena. Absolutely. Thank you. And before we go, can you please tell our viewers where we can find some more of your work? Just Google my name, Mordechai Kedar, M-O-R. D-E-C-H-A-I, Kedar, it's K-E-D-A-R. I have many clips on YouTube, and uh, not enough in English, I know. Uh, most of them are in Hebrew and in Arabic. Uh, after all, I have to address the Arab world as well, not only the English-speaking world. Uh, I have articles also in English. I am quoted in many places. Just Google my name and you'll find a lot of uh, material. Wonderful. Thank you so much. So we've come to the close of our webinar. Thank you again, Dr. Kadar, for joining us today. Pleasure. For our viewers, please join us Wednesday at 3 p.m. Eastern with Alex Selsky for an update on Israel Insider. Thank you all for joining us, and I hope you have a wonderful day. Thanks again.